This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. The biggest, the biggest icon in podcasting. Happy birthday to the DOC. Thanks, everybody, for downloading the latest edition of Doc and Jock. I am the Doc, the birthday boy, 42 years young today. As you're listening to this, I'm happy, I'm chilling, chilling at home today, uh, going to relax, just try and uh, cover the lines a little bit, sleep in, maybe even day drink if the weather's nice today. Always enjoy the conversation with my guy, Adam. we got a lot to get to in the world of college basketball, the Detroit Lions making their moves. Oh, my goodness, cuz. It is a wild time right now in Detroit sports. Yeah, and stole a lot for sure for you, brother. 42, congratulations on living another year and doing big things in that year. So congratulations on that. It, it's good to see that you're taking two days off in a row. What are you, what are you doing? Oh. Like, like, we don't, like we don't have multiple businesses to run here. <laughs> Look, I need a couple days off, man. At least most people take the weekends off. I'm going six, seven days a week sometimes. I like it, but at the same time, I absolutely am going to heed your advice, take a couple days off in March. As you know, it's March Madness, baby. That means you got to figure out ways to call off during the first and second rounds of the NCAA tournament. you got to figure this shit out. we got to find ways to sneak it in on your phone as you're writing loans up. we got to figure out how to get connected to the world when we're doing stuff. We all try it, you know. We all try and do things, you know, that cough on that Tuesday, Wednesday situation before so we can sit sit on our asses and uh, be able to watch Netflix real fast before we get into Detroit sports. Yeah, I'm real disappointed. How do you write a movie that has no jokes and is not funny at all? (laughs) Coming to America, I heard it. I'm like, it can't be this bad. It was an homage to the first movie, but I watched the first movie 50 times. You can't just tell the same story over again and say, hey, let's just, they actually used, I've never seen a movie that used extended scenes from the old movie. It was, That's crazy. It's crazy, bro. I chuckled twice. I feel bad for you, man, because yeah. you were you were so excited to see this, and you're like, this is my favorite movie of all time, and you were hoping that the sequel would at least live up to some of the hype, and it sounds like it lived up to none of the hype for you. No. The, you know, unfortunately, I started to hear that it wasn't good, and maybe that skewed it a little bit, but it was good to see the characters, but it, there's, no, there's no rewatch value at all. Once you watch it, it's done. It's, uh, you know what, to be honest, I'm just going to probably, today on my birthday, watch the original one again because there were so many quotable scenes, so many things that you remember from coming to America. The writer, shame on you for telling that story and making it devoid of any real laugh-out-loud comedy. Shame on you guys. When somebody watched it, somebody sort of said, this isn't funny. This, there's nothing to this. There's no jokes. It's a story. It's the old characters. But part of a comedy is to make people fall over laughing, and there was not really any moments like that. So I rated a D-. minus. Don't watch it. There's no rewatch value. I mean, if you're into it, you get a good sense of nostalgia, but you're going to walk away disappointed. And you know who else is going to walk away disappointed? Illinois, baby, because they're not getting anything in regards to recognition, in regards to getting uh, acknowledged as being the Big Ten champs. But because they're not, they have a case because of the fact. No case. Listen, here's the problem. Shame on you. Shame on you for trolling and and just elaborating upon (laughs) this argument that that those trolls in Illinois are, are. are preparing here. Like, come on, man. What are you doing? Let me pontificate for a moment because I feel like I need, I needed, I needed to express the fair point in this whole story. And as everybody knows, I am the king of fairness and (laughs) and, and looking at objectivity and fairness, Mm -hmm. I I listened to the Illinois argument. I didn't simply dismiss it like Jay, uh, like Jawan Howard did. I looked at it and I said, what is this argument here that they're talking about? So I doubled down, I did some research, and I said, okay, here's what's here's the crux of the argument. Illinois played the entire schedule, and they won 16 games. Very solid 16-4 record in the Big Ten, which should be commended. They played Michigan and won by double digits. Very solid mm-hmm. performance, I believe, on the road. So they were able to accomplish quite a bit. 
Under the old rules, they would be declared the Big Ten champions. But because it's a COVID area, uh, COVID era, the you know presidents and whoever came up with this idea that they should go with to correct the fact that some teams might not play all the games, the winning percentage, everybody had to sign off on it. But it is a cockamamie rule, and who goes by win percentage? It's not anything of value and of note. So I'm of the opinion that going by the old rules, Illinois should lay claim to being co-Big Ten champs. because Get they played, out of here. Because they played head-to-head in the name of objectivity and fairness, no bias at all, Illinois has a right to say, hey, we played you, we did better, Who? why are we going to let... The fact that uh, Michigan got a little vacation and got to oh. rest up and okay. load up. All right, you're done. <laughs> Shut up now. Shut up now. Zip your lips. All right, so here's the deal, okay? If you're going to be mad at anybody, be mad at the Big Ten. All right, be mad at the Big Ten presidents. Be mad at the at, at the Big Ten chancellors. Be mad at the Big Ten. That's what you want to be mad at. Go ahead and be mad at them. Because at football time, right, during the football season, the Big Ten changed the rules to get Ohio State into the national championship game to get them into the big 10 championship game. So they can then punch their ticket to go on and play in the BCS. So if you're going to be mad at anybody, be mad at them. They changed the rules then. So going into the basketball season, these were the rules Michigan played by the rules. Now what happened and no fault of uh, no fault of the basketball teams or no fault of uh, Jawan Howard, the, the actual school Mark Schlissel shut everything down at the university for two weeks they missed three games because not because they wanted to but because the school president said we have to shut everything down because COVID is running wild we have to protect the students it was basically hulk hogan in the 80s with the 24 inch pythons everything's going crazy and they're running wild you want to be mad at anybody be mad at the big 10 don't be mad at michigan and no illinois does not get the claim that they are co- Big Ten champs. That is a troll job if I've ever seen it. The rules are the rules. You play by the rules, and that's what it is, okay? I don't understand this this harebrained idea. You ended up you ended up beating Michigan. Good job. I think it was like after Michigan had just played back-to-back-to-back-to-back games. So good on you for beating them, but you still lost more games, and... If I look at the schedule correctly, uh, did they win? Maybe I think they might have won maybe one or two more games. So either way, it works out. The whole thing was win percentage. Michigan won. They had a better win percentage. Game over. On top of all that, if you really wanna, if you really wanna set this up a little bit deeper, and and I'm gonna be a little bit of a troll here now for you, Michigan State fans, because I see how all of you guys rejoice like you actually won something this year. Like your basketball program hasn't been a complete dirty diaper all season long. Like you guys maybe kind of figured it out, which it didn't. If that game on Sunday meant anything, if Michigan needed that to win a Big Ten championship, I think it would have been a different game. I'm gonna go out there and say it. I'm gonna say Michigan would have whipped your ass by at least ten. So big deal. I mean, what are we talking about then? There would have been a, a, a two-loss difference. You've still been claiming co-champions if you're Illinois. Get the hell out of here. This is such trash. I can't believe this even made it to our rundown. I'm so annoyed that it's on here. Oh, I thought that Jawan Howard gave a fair answer, but we need to look at why was Michigan allowed to uh, have three weeks off when there were no COVID cases on that roster one bit? There was no documented case of COVID. They got because a little— the, they, they the got campus a little, was— because the campus was freaking going bonkers, man. I feel like Go- Michigan has discovered a loophole in this COVID game. Yeah. And they're using it, it to their advantage in order to gain favor and results. And they felt like, okay, we could take a little mini vacation here. This you know, if edge. somebody who had credibility said this, I would maybe look into it a little bit more. But it's you. And you live under a bridge. And you're looking for the toll from the troll. So, no, I will not pay you your troll toll. I believe that you need to look at the name of the game, which is fairness and objectivity, and really takes take plight of these young college kids who went out and won 16 out of 20 Big Ten games and recognize that, hey, you know, they played in a COVID era, and I acknowledge both sides of the argument. So I think in the name of fairness, we have to acknowledge the season that Illinois had, and we have to kind of discount the season that Michigan had because they took a pause for some weird reason. Oh, and, yeah. And, it's called and, COVID. It's called the pandemic. And, the fact that we have sports going 
going on in the pandemic is crazy. And they played head to head, which I felt like was a real solid marker of what was going to take place. And I believe that Illinois winning by that wide a margin really mm-hmm. dictated to me that Illinois has a case here. But that's here, no there. Yeah. I, I see your side of things. as Michigan was playing catch up from their from their COVID. COVID layoff, as you would deem it, their COVID vacation. Michigan was playing catch up and playing a game every other night. You're right. I, I'm, continue. I, continue. I, I would like to know what happened uh, with Michigan when they played Michigan State because it feels like they could not handle success in the manner in which a program no. of that stature would you kind got, of indicate. They, they got go- a gigantic tournament coming up, and you've just been playing a ton of games. So what? They mailed it in. Yes. Let's not act like Michigan State hasn't done this before. No. In all seriousness, was it a tactical error by Juwan Howard to play a lot of the starters in this rivalry game because you now uh, open yourself up for criticism because Eli Brooks did indeed suffer a leg injury. So I felt like, you know what, knowing that the game really didn't mean anything to Michigan, I think you could have rested a lot of people and probably avoided uh, injuries to Dickinson and anybody else and by, by playing the starters that many minutes in a game that probably was going to result in a lot more risk than reward. You know, Eli Brooks got hurt. Y- you risked hurting your big-time center there, who obviously could also now have a confidence issue after a game like that where he struggled mightily without, without his legs and being so tired. I think that that game, probably looking back at it, if in the Big Ten tournament and uh, in, in the NCAA – if Eli Brooks doesn't come up big, uh, you might have a case that Juwan Howard made a tactical error. Yeah, that's one of those games where I think you get away with playing your starters 15 minutes in the first half. Maybe you roll them out there for five minutes in the second half, and, and you just call it good. You you kind of see what you have as far as some of your younger talent. You get some guys who don't get enough reps during the regular season, some reps here going into, going into the tournament, and you just try to keep some fresh legs on a couple guys. There was really no need to play that many minutes for your starters. There was no need to, to risk injury here. It'll be one of those things where, as the Big Ten tournament kind of plays out, we'll kind of have to see what happens with this team. You know, if you're a competitor, you want to be out there, you want to be playing. If you're if you're a coach, though, I think you sometimes have to take a step back and you, you can't just see the tree. You got to see the whole forest. You got to see the bigger picture. You already wrapped up the Big Ten uh, regular season. Uh, you are the champion. There is no denying that you played by the rules. You had the best win percentage in the Big Ten. So you're that you're crowned that there is really no need for this game. Uh, as far as records go, uh, I guess maybe for for seeding in the in uh in you know in, in the NCAA tournament, it makes sense because after this weekend, Michigan ended up falling from from two to four. So maybe maybe for seeding purposes, that's why. But I think you can make a lot of that up if you have a really strong performance in the Big Ten tournament. Maybe even come away as as double champs, winning the the regular season as well as the the Big Ten tournament. So uh, I want to know where you think Michigan state's going uh, as far as the big 10 tournament is, is taken into account here. Uh, big 10 tournament is about to get underway. And do you see them making it all the way to Sunday? Or is this uh, one of those things where it's, it's one and done for them? Or is this something where they don't win any games and they're just kind of packaged up and shipped out in any chance? Cause I think, I think at this point, if you're Michigan state, yeah, you had a really good performance against Michigan uh, last Sunday, but if you're Michigan state, I think you have to have a good showing in the Big Ten tournament to try to punch a ticket to get into the NCAA tournament. Now, I know a couple of weeks ago I was saying no matter what Izzo's getting in, they're not going to try to hold up his record. And I think that has some validity, but that was before they ended up losing a couple of games. And I think at this point, Michigan State's got to look, they have to look competitive in the Big Ten tournament. Yeah, they have to. Michigan State... I think the rest will really aid the team. I think Aaron Henry, I think uh, Josh Langford, who kind of has been uh, kind of still dealing with the leg, the ramifications of all the situations and injuries he's been dealing with. He's kind of slowed down a little bit. I think that the time off will indeed help Michigan State. I think they're going to, you know, and here's the thing. Here's what sucks. 1130 on my birthday, I got to sit and watch (laughs) and, and grip for Michigan State. And then if they do come away with the victory today, I got to grip the next morning and try and watch Michigan, Michigan State again? Are you serious? I think it's one and done. I think that they're going to play. I think that, obviously, Michigan earned the double bye, and you can't expect a team like Michigan State to play a tough-fought game 
in the first round of the Big Ten tournament, and then 24 hours later go up against the rival. It's just going to be pound town to the big center, and uh, it'll be a good, fun game, but Michigan will advance. and It'll be one and done. All that Michigan State's got to do is win the first game. They get themselves in the tournament, and then all the fun stuff happens. And I know in years past I've said that, in all seriousness, I've always felt like Michigan State would advance. This is the year it's pretty much a safe assumption for me to say that Michigan's going to make a nice run at least I can assume to the Elite Eight, and then the and then the big dogs will come, and we'll see what happens. But I think Michigan State could be a one and done team in the tournament as well. It really is going to all depend on Aaron Henry and how they play defense, and does Rocket Watts step up because he's kind of has the, the the markings of a player that if he gets hot early, then he he performs, but if he doesn't, he's a wall. And you're not going to be carried by Langford and anybody else outside of Aaron Henry. So I, I, I think everything is looking great right now as we preview uh, what's going to happen. It, everything's looking good for Michigan to have a nice run and all we can hope for so that we can finally, to bring it full circle, we can settle my debate when Illinois beats Michigan in the Big Ten tourney final. Hmm. So this is, this is the thing. I think Michigan... I think Michigan has a real strong case to win the whole damn thing, right? Mm. To, uh, mm, oh, mm. I saw it'll Gonzaga inter- come back from twelve, and they're undefeated. It, it, it'll be it'll be interesting to to see what happens when uh, Michigan ends up going up against Illinois, because I do think Michigan makes it to uh, to, to to Sunday. I think they make it to to the Big Ten final. I think with all the noise coming out of Illinois, I think that that motivates Michigan and that gives them a whole bunch of reasons to go out there and lay an ass whipping on the fighting on a lion. I, I think as far as Michigan state's concerned, I think they're, they're probably done when they run up against Michigan. Um, It's going to have to be a really good first win for them to, to really be able to do anything to get into the, to get into the NCAA tournament. I wouldn't be surprised if they were the first four out. But as far as Michigan goes, I think Michigan's going to, as as far as the the Big Ten tournament goes, I think Michigan's going to end up locking up uh, one of those number one number one seeds. They probably they'll probably go in there as as the third or fourth best team uh, in the nation. So they'll get a they'll get a one seed for sure. And uh, I think Elite Eight, Final Four. I think at this point, Final Four is the expectation for this team. And we'll see what happens there. I know how you're. I know like how you're hedging your bets, and you're like, "Oh no, it, it's it's Elite Eight. I, I don't think so. I think it's Final Four. If you're a Michigan fan, oh, that'd be nice if you guys could get that final, uh, you know, opportunity to take a nice step forward. I know you've been there to the the final game, and it, it hasn't worked out. So we'll see. It'll be interesting. I just don't see big, you know, Final Four situations for the University of Michigan. We shall see. But turning our attention to what's going on with the Lions. It's a real fascinating situation in regards to the decision that was made with Kenny Galladay and Romeo Aquara. I was a staunch believer that Kenny Galladay was indeed going to be franchise tag. They didn't do it. I'm shocked. Romeo Aquara, same thing. Both are headed to the free agency market, and it's all likelihood signals a real rebuild. Both guys, maybe Aquara comes back with a long-term deal. But I'm floored because it looks like Brad Holmes understands the cards that he's dealt. While it stinks to lose a player of Kenny Galladay's caliber, I'm all in agreement with the move made. You can probably replace a player of that caliber in the draft or free agency. You don't spend $20 million a year on a receiver on a team that's in a first year of a rebuild. Unbelievable. They made the right call. I'm just surprised they actually did it. It's weird having comparable uh, management, right? It's different as a as a Lions fan, not really used to this. But that was definitely the right call. The fact that it came out that he was offered eighteen to nineteen million dollars, Kenny Galladay was, by the way, and he turned it down. It just goes to show you that he didn't want to be here. So him being franchised, he was going to be bad for that locker room. I'm glad that they didn't spend that sixteen million dollars on him. It, with with the cap number coming out uh, on on Wednesday, what is it, one hundred and eighty four point five million dollars? I think. Look, the, their cap space is going to be an obstacle that not many first-year GMs really have to navigate like Brad Holmes is going to have to navigate. So getting rid of a guy like Kenny Galladay and, and letting go of a guy like Romeo Aquaro, who, like you said, might come back on a long-term deal. I wouldn't be mad about that. But Kenny Galladay, I, I, look, I didn't think he should have came back. I didn't think he should have been franchised. I didn't think that he should have been offered $19 million. I get that he might be a number one wide receiver. You know what? 
just not here, just not now. This this team, this organization has so much work it has to do. And look, I think this kind of sets into motion that this is a full blown rebuild. If you're a Lions fan, you should be excited because it shows you have a general manager who knows what the hell he's doing, which is fantastic. Like you got a guy in here who has taken account of, which is great. It's fantastic that they're going to be bad next year. It's going to set up really nicely for uh, the upcoming draft. After that, if you don't get a quarterback this year, you can always get a quarterback next year because you're going to be in the top five. I think this was smart. All of this was smart. This is not a, it's not a short play. It's all a long play. It's not all about just winning this year. It's about setting yourself up for future success in years to come. And I love it. I think it's fantastic. Yeah, it is. I think that, yeah, it's going to be tough for a lot of supporters of the Lions to see them struggle and to see them not really be in a lot of games. I th- The person that you feel really bad for is Jared Goff because of the fact that he has to recognize, sitting here on Thursday, March 11th, he has to sit here and recognize that the Lions are in their first year uh, of a rebuild and he's coming in and the winning is not going to take place early on. It's it's, it's going to be tough early on for this regime to, to, to gain traction. Yeah, they'll be competitive. I just think that bottom line in, in the winning categories – there's going to be some times where you know they're going to come up short on the talent end. But again, if everybody recognizes what's going on, if everybody recognizes what the role and objective is in a first year of a rebuild, then everybody's going to be aware of what's going on in regards to the objectives, which are develop young players, build a culture, set forth the path that everybody's going to try and need to take to, to take hold of in this organization. So winning is just the last thing that people are going to need to just focus in on. Focus in on the development of DeAndre Swift. Focus in on the development of TJ Hawkinson. Focus in on the development of Quintez Cephas. How does golf look in the offensive line? But wins and losses, man. I think Dan Campbell really understood what the the nature of the beast was when he got a six-year deal because year one is going to be a rebuild year, a teardown year. And I don't think that the Lions are going to regret letting go of Kenny Galladay because you just can't pay a man that much money who's coming off of an injury plague season who obviously turned down big money to stay. It may just be, if this takes off, the sentinel moment will be Kenny Galladay deciding that, hey, I'm going to turn down the Lions' long-term money because of the fact, could you imagine the cuts that would have had to take place or the oh, nightmare yeah. scenarios that you would have had to have done with a $182.5 million cap trying to figure out how to lop off $16 million? You might have had to uh, have, have lopped off and taken a hit on Trey Flowers, uh, other players that you potentially need to be on this roster. It would have put you in such a bad spot with your salary cap and your roster building that it wouldn't have made sense. That's why I love the move. That's why I think it was such a smart move. And it tells you everything you need to know about your general manager. And it tells you everything you need to know about your head coach. Like both these guys get it. This isn't one of those things where it's a short term deal. This is a long term rebuild. They took, they took account and they took stock of what they've got in the cupboards. And they realized there's not a whole lot here to work with. There really isn't. Brad Holmes really helped put this organization in a good spot by trading away Matt Stafford and getting back everything he got. He's got a quarterback that's going to be here for at least two years. So at least you know that position going into the year. That position is at least taken care of. That way you don't have to deal with what is, I'm going to say, the worst free agent signing ever in Chase Daniels. And I'll explain that in a minute. But you have you have your quarterback position locked up for at least two years. So then what it does is it buys you a little bit of time to figure out whether or not you need to address quarterback this year, or you can wait and address quarterback next year. It gives you a little bit of, it gives you a little bit of flexibility there. And both these guys understand and both these guys realize, Hey, first year, it's not going to be good. It's going to be pretty ugly. Actually, it's going to be horrible. So if you're a Lions fan, get prepared for sucking. Honestly, be prepared for it. And here's the thing. Sucking's not bad. It's going to be a really, really good thing. The, the worse you are next year, the better this organization will be in the future because by not signing a guy like Kenny Galladay, taking that money and then either redistributing it across your roster, or going out and picking up cheaper free agents who can be here on shorter term deals. So when you are ready to win, you've got a ton of money to go out there and get some impactful guys. 
it shows you all you need to know about what you have with this front office and with this head coach. It's going to be patience. And I think this front office and this head coach are going to preach patience for, for the next season and a half. But what's going to happen is, like you said, watch the development. See if DeAndre Swift turns into, into that guy that, that he's projected to be. See if Quintez Cephas takes another step forward. See if this O-line really gels and solidifies and becomes something decent. See if this defense gets revamped and comes back and is a, is a top 10 defense in the league instead of being a, a bottom three defense in the league. It, it, there, are, there are little things that, that you will be able to see, and it's not going to be all about wins and losses. So you just have to be patient. Now, before you, you have to be absolutely patient. Before you talk about one of the laughable articles and stories that came out in the last year, there is an argument to be made because just in the last offseason, people saw the Detroit Lions made a decision on Darius Slay, and they didn't mm-hmm. pay him. Obviously, he didn't go and like light up the the defense for the Eagles. He struggled, and the team did not do well. And, of course, he restructured his contract this offseason. But, unfortunately, people are glomming on to the idea that, look, you replaced Darius Slay with Desmond Trufant, and you got worse. Yeah. Could you make the argument that if you're going to rebuild – wouldn't it be a safe play to at least have a player on your roster that can take the top off the defense for, you know, the next four years? You sign them to a four-year deal, you rebuild for one year, and you have a whole draft class and a whole offseason to potentially utilize the skills of a 29, 30, and a 31-year-old Kenny Galladay. It's a fair argument to potentially look at, did the Lions make a mistake this in, is the, here's the, in, in making this, this happen? No, here's the thing. This thing we didn't even talk about. We didn't even bring this up. Kenny Galladay's an older guy. He's an older wide receiver. Coming off a rookie contract, Kenny Galladay is 27. He's going to be 28 in November. Kenny Galladay was one of those dudes who really liked college, apparently, as much as I did, and got out super late. Maybe not as late as I did, but got out super late. Kenny Galladay was drafted when he was like 23. So that means by the time you're ready to win, Kenny Galladay is going to be 31 maybe 30 and you just let go. You just brought it up yourself. You just let go of a cornerback who was 30, 30. And you talked about how he declined. Can you imagine when speed is your, is your asset and your leaping ability? That is your asset. And that is what you bring to the table. And that is what makes you uh, what everybody is saying as a number one wide receiver. I'm not really sure he's a number one wide receiver because the guy can't get separation. It's the one thing that's harmed him since he's come into the league. He doesn't have the ability to separate from those good cornerbacks. He can now jump up guys. So like 50, 50 balls, he's got all day. It's because he's like six, three, six, four. When you're playing a cornerback, who's like five, nine, I mean, you should be able to win those. He doesn't He doesn't have incredible breakaway speed, and he can't get away from guys. So I don't think this is a bad move. I think this is a fantastic move because by the time you're able to win, he's going to be older. He's going to actually slow down. On top of that, he didn't want to be here. He didn't take $18, $19 million. So what the hell – is 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 going to say that he's going to be good for that locker room when we already talked about you're going to lose next season it's going to be bad and you're not going to get this whole ship righted in one one off season we both agree on that there's no way there are too many holes on this roster to get this thing right in one off season it's going to take at least two maybe three years to get it really right. So no, I don't think you missed. I don't think you, I don't think this was a bad move. I don't think it was a a thing that's going to really hurt this organization. If anything, I think it makes this organization better by getting rid of a guy who didn't want to be in that locker room, by getting rid of a guy who is he for, for a wide receiver, the guy is almost middle-aged. That sounds very critical seeing how he's 27 going to be 28. All right. But by the time you're ready to win, he's going to be, uh, he's going to be in his thirties. And I just don't want a, a 30 year old malcontent on my roster when I'm ready to win. I'm just not doing it. Okay. And then the final story, the funniest thing I think that came across the news for the Detroit Lions was them trying to put out a feeler to see if anybody would trade for Chase Daniel. A guy, though, that I think even though we're going to laugh a little bit at his expense, dude's made $38 million and has thrown less than 300 career passes. That is OG-type stuff right there in order to be able to stay in the NFL that long without having really done or accomplished anything other than he can watch film, he can tutor and be a mentor to people. But I don't even think you're going to get a seventh-rounder for Chase Daniel because everyone knows your situation. 
mm-hmm. it was laughable, and I think mm-hmm. really a signing that was indicative of how awful <laughs> Bob Quinn really was in his job. This might be Bob Quinn's worst signing, and it's not just because of the contract that you gave Chase Daniels, the three-year, $19 million contract. It's not the fact that when Chase Daniels did get called upon and did get put into into service and, and you had to lean on him to help you try to win a football game or at least look relevant in a football game, he looked completely in over his head. No, no, it had nothing to do with all of that. It has to do with going back to last year's draft. By you signing Chase Daniels when you did, you totally showed everybody in the National Football League your cards. And instead of being able to leverage that third round pick to get either to, to, to trade back and get more out of it or or to at least pretend like if you weren't impressed with Tua and you knew you weren't going to be able to get Joe Burrow or you weren't impressed with Justin Herbert, which, again, failure on your part because Justin Herbert looks like the real freaking deal. If you weren't able to leverage those quarterbacks or go pick one of those quarterbacks or leverage that pick to get more draft capital, at least for last year and just move back a couple spots. I mean, Miami took Tua. Miami was into Tua. Miami could have traded up. You could have got a second round pick out of them and you, you, you could have, you could have moved back two spots and you could have picked up Jeff Okuda and you'd have been, you'd have been fine with Okuda and you'd have had an extra draft pick that you could have blew on something else. That was Bob Quinn's worst worst and probably the organization, the, the the Detroit Lions, worst free agent signing ever because it didn't just impact that season in one game, didn't just impact this season because of the salary cap structure. It didn't impact the season going forward because of the salary cap. No, it impacted the future of this organization because of what it did with that draft when they had the third overall pick and they possibly could have moved down to five, maybe even a little bit lower, picked up a few other pieces and possibly had something for a guy like Brad Holmes to maybe work with, or at least found something to help. I mean, this sounds crazy right now, but you have to remember, put yourself back into, into, into last year's mindset. Bob Quinn, and Matt Patricia were in win now mode. That's why I don't think it made any sense to any of us that you would draft a cornerback. It just it like, you're not going to get the type of production you need because they take, they take too long to develop. They take at least a good season to develop. And I think that was pretty evident by Jeff Okuda's often, oftentimes struggles. So I just think it was the, one of the worst signings in, in franchise history. Yeah. As well as you can make the case, Desmond Trufant was pretty bad as well. Yep. Big fat contract that got lopped off. So that's good. I like the fact that Brad Holmes (laughs) is lopping off some of these guys that really aren't going to be needed in this defense. Christian Jones, Desmond Trufant, more to come, probably Justin Coleman. So you look at it and you say to yourself, all right, the salary cap situation is not as bad as everybody thinks it is. So let's just take advantage of the fact that Brad Holmes understands that, okay, we need faster, uh, leaner, and tougher individuals at multiple spots. And he's recognizing he's going to now systematically undo all the wrongdoings of uh, Bob Quinn and Matt Patricia. And hopefully now the, the, the ingredients he selects in the upcoming draft and in free agency are guys that actually will produce, stay on the field, and actually represent the Lions in the way in which everybody wants, not guys that come in and get hurt and don't target guys that are, uh, you know, have a history of, uh, of prolonged injuries and then wonder why they come in here and, and don't produce. So things are looking hey, up at this point in time. Are you are you hopeful? Like, yes, I, I yes. feel like this is the first time in a long time as a Lions fan. Yes, I'm hopeful. I, I feel confident, and and I'm hopeful. Like, I'm not I'm not upset with this organization. It's so weird to not to not be super negative about this organization, but I like what I'm seeing. It, like, so far, these so are, good. These are moves that make sense. It, it all makes sense. Yes, pro moves. So that's what Brad Holmes and Dan. Hey, and at the bottom line. They're talking in the media a whole heck of a lot more. Uh, yeah. I think that uh, Bob Quinn talked twice in, in, in a year, and, and this guy now, Brad Holmes, is doing podcasts. you got to love that. Dan Campbell is going on back-to-back shows. I mean, when Dan Campbell goes on Pat McAfee and we get a chance to grade it, people like to read it, and, and, and he performed. You know, he's got a good sense of gab. He, he, he understands what people are looking for in regards to content, and the fact of the matter is the Lions are making a lot more people a lot more available 
And that can only be a good sign. Transparency. Hey, when you say, hey, we're going to make moves and then you make them, that's all we're looking for is to just allow people to understand what's going on. It's not rocket science. Everybody knows you're going to be in the market for either a wide receiver or a player on defense. And it's not going to be something where, hey, at least he said, hey, the the option to draft a quarterback is not off the table. We need to look at everything. That's all we needed him to say. And he went out and said it, and that still puts into play the potential that Detroit could make a play there at quarterback. And then that forces the teams behind you to at least consider, hey, we have to make a trade with Detroit. We got to offer something because they seriously could take a quarterback at that spot. And so Brad, uh, so Brad Holmes is playing the game in the manner in which he needs to. And that's all you can ask for. That's the birthday gift you can give to the DOC this year, Lions, is just to be competitive and to draft people that uh, will get at least a B grade by the majority of scouts and pundits. Make sure you follow Adam on Twitter at Adam R S T R O Z. Follow the network at Detroit Podcast. This episode 397, a little bit shorter because it's my birthday and I want to get my drink on and I want to relax and watch some basketball on one of my rare days off. Uh, thank you for subscribing. Anywhere you listen to your favorite podcast, make sure you hit Detroit Sports Podcast and our daily content will find you. Or if you're uh, lazy and don't want to subscribe, all you got to do is go follow us on Twitter at Detroit Podcast. We post each and every episode. All you got to do is take your fat thumb and push that button, and our content plays anywhere that you can listen to quality audio. Cuz, thank you. You've given me a great birthday gift. You've recorded sports. You've debated me. You've listened and entertained my wild and crazy ideas for the better part of eight years. And we're approaching 400 of these episodes. I can't wait. Things are looking better all across the board in every facet of sports, life. And let's just keep this train rolling. Uh, Best wishes to Doc and Jock as we push toward episode 400. And for all the teams uh, locally and in college to have a lot more prosperity in the years to come. Happy birthday, cuz. Hopefully it's a great one.